All right, lecture six, transmission lines and signal propagation. This is a very advanced chapter and one that we normally, uh, in, the, in the past we haven't looked at this stuff in third year. And uh, this year, due to difficulties that a lot of students have had in fourth year with these concepts and then when working in labs, we're going to include a cursory overview of a lot of the realities of, of signal propagation and transmission lines but uh, we're not we don't really have the the time the bandwidth so to speak to address a lot of these topics in the in the detail that they probably deserve so if you're interested and and uh, need to do more uh, more work with these in the future then please come back and have a look at the sections in the book in detail especially a lot of the sections that we skip circuit model of the transmission line we found in earlier chapters that coaxial cable has an inductance per unit length and a capacitance per unit length. Now we're going to look at those and consider a couple of things. So there's a section in this chapter that looks at the losses due to inductance and capacitance. This is not quite that. We're going to consider the effect of uh, the effect of how long it takes the wave to get set up in the first place. So as we apply a high frequency signal to this, then maybe the wavelength is short enough that the voltage can be changing along the length of the cable. That's what we're considering here. Now, the voltage at one section is related to the voltage at the next section by Kirchhoff's laws. We can say, okay, well, it's voltage across the capacitor plus voltage across the inductor has to equal this. And so we find using our relations that the voltage across the inductor is L I dot current in this section. We also imagine that the current can change from one section to the next, and we can repeat the equation to find another expression for V n in terms of V n plus one and the current in this section. Then using the node rule for the current here, we say that the current through the capacitor and the current through uh, I n has to be related, I n plus one rather, has to be related to the current through I n. Okay, then what we can do is combine these equations together. You can try the substitutions yourself and find out that we get an expression like this. This is a difference term which is uh, which is a derivative in the limit of small dx and same as same with this one and then the combination of these two with the other dx division gives us a second derivative. So we've got a wave equation as expected. We know that electro uh, we know that even at low frequencies this electric field set up if we look at its time dependence then it's going to be an electromagnetic wave so changing electric fields create magnetic fields and vice versa and they propagate along as electromagnetic waves so the speed of the wave we'd expect it to be the speed of light sure enough when we use the values that we got for v here with the L and the C that we derived back in chapter two for coax cable, we find that it is one over root epsilon naught mu naught. Go ahead and plug in one over root epsilon naught mu naught in, uh, in a calculator by looking up the values of permittivity and permeability of free space, and you'll find that it is indeed the speed of light in a vacuum. So what if we didn't have, uh, if we didn't have vacuum in between the cables, if we had some kind of a dielectric, then we would just modify epsilon naught to be epsilon r. Okay, so we've got the speed, we in this section just determined that yes, waves do propagate along electric cables if we allowed the potential for there to be a different potential at one spot and the next, and they propagate along at the speed of light. 3.2, impedance of a transmission line. Now we can calculate an impedance of the cable if we divide the voltage of the propagating wave by the current of the propagating wave. Doing that, we come up with an impedance using the information from the last section of root mu naught over epsilon naught ln b over a divided by two pi. So mu naught and epsilon naught are the permittivity, uh, permeability and permittivity of free space respectively. B and a were the radii of the outer core and the inner core of the cylinder. The, uh, that make up the coaxial cable. This turns out to be independent of the length, so we've got an impedance of the cable that shows up just on the, on the basis that it's a coaxial cable. In fact, if we have any other pair of, of cables representing a closed circuit, then they would also have an impedance 
intrinsic to themselves that we could calculate in a in a similar way. This is the impedance that's relevant that's relevant if you're looking at the setup of the wave. So as the wave is initially propagating down the uh, cable and then getting maybe reflected off the end and transmitting back, interfering with itself at the source. After that point, it would the source wouldn't see the same impedance because we wouldn't be able to use these exact same expressions for the ratio of voltage and current. But at least when the wave is initially getting set up, then we see this as the impedance of the cable, the output impedance in, uh, looking into the cable. For a vacuum, we come up with 377 ohms, and, uh, and these factors usually don't change this all that much. Considering all the permeativity using a dielectric and everything else. Typical cables have impedances on the order of 50 to 100 ohms. 50 is by far the most common and that's why a lot of uh, a lot of pieces of electric equipment will have an output impedance of 50 ohms. We'll see why you'd want to do so-called impedance matching in the next section. Transmission lines are a general class of systems known as waveguides in that they tell the electromagnetic wave where to go. The limitation that we're uh, of this uh, section. So this section was kind of, was looking at what happens if you have a wavelength of electromagnetic radiation which is short compared to the length of the cable. Then you have to consider all this wave propagation stuff. But what if the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation is also short not just to the length of the cable but to the diameter of the cable? Then there's another thing that we've neglected so far which is that we have to uh, we have to look at the fact that the waves can't be considered perfect plane waves anymore. We have to look at how they propagate laterally as well, or at least how they may vary in the lateral direction. Uh, so if your waves are incredibly short, then even this, even this analysis is not a, a, not a very valid one. 3.3, reflection of signals at interfaces. Now suppose that our electromagnetic wave is traveling in one cable and then it hits another cable that has a different impedance. In general, the wave can be reflected back and partially transmitted. Let's say that the electric field has to be continuous across the boundary. You can uh, learn about why that is the case in electrodynamics. Now suffice it to say that that's true and the voltages therefore also have to add up. We can say that the reflected electric field is R times E naught, where E naught is the incident one. R is called the reflection coefficient and the transmitted one, T E naught, is determined by the transmission coefficient T. Doing some electrodynamics you can come up with the values for these two. The reflection coefficient is Z2 minus Z1 over the sum of the impedances in the cables and the transmission coefficient is just 1 plus the reflection one. <clears throat> so the reflection coefficient that you would get if the output impedance is the same as the input impedance is 0 and then the transmission is 100%. So if you impedance match then there's no reflection. All of the, all of the wave keeps propagating forward. That could be if the cable on the other side is the same impedance, has the same intrinsic impedance as the first cable, or if on the other side you put a resistor or some kind of a load that has the same impedance as the cable. So you impedance match and all of the energy uh, gets transmitted directly through. The wave just propagates along. Now, what happens if you just short the output? So you have Z2 is zero. Well, now the wave is reflected back and inverted. You can calculate R is negative 1 and T is 0. None of the wave propagates forward. It's completely reflected back. In another limiting case, if we have, what happens if there's an open circuit on the other side? So we put this as infinite impedance. Uh, that may be because there's an actually open circuit or because you put an impedance here which is much higher than your cable impedance. Interestingly, then you also get a reflection back. So in that case, if Z2 is very large, you see the reflection goes towards 100%. This happens when you, uh, you open the output, and this can be pretty bad if you're using a high frequency amplifier so that you reflect all of the energy back into your source. It's the most common way to blow out high frequency amplifiers, so you don't wanna do that. Turn it off before you disconnect the output. Now, where is this impedance? It's in the, it's in the cable in series during the setup of the wave. This, is, this happens when you transmit um, the wave from the source to the other end of the cable, and then it, in general, will reflect off of the other end and transmit back. But as it's going back, it interferes with the, uh, with the wave that was traveling forward still, and 
uh, the result is the two of them in superposition so that it's no longer true that the voltage to current ratio gives you the same impedance that you calculate for the cable. So this is something that you have to be concerned with if, again, your wavelengths are short compared with the length of the cable. If they're very long compared with the length of the cable, then the voltage and current can be considered a constant everywhere. And uh, due to the, the series of reflections and interference, we'd use regular voltage uh, current and cable calculations uh, that we were using in different chapters without having to consider the intrinsic cable impedance due to its resistance and capacitance. We're going to be skipping 3.4 and 3.5 on to 3.6 transformers. So you may remember from first year that the that in general power lines like to have high voltage and low current to carry power because that means that you lose less power in the in the resistive losses in the cables because the power lost in the resistance of the cables is the current going through them squared times their resistance but it's not the voltage the high voltage is not really placed across the cable from one part to the next part in the cable and so we don't have to be concerned with that kind of a loss now for high frequency this can kind of matter because we've got a voltage shorting to ground across a capacitor and that draws a different amount of current due to that in uh, in shorter time scale so locally along the cable you can have a bunch of back and forth current fluctuations that drain into these resistors so that's uh, that's not good which means that there's a new consideration that we have to consider for AC in very long distances and that's that the the power carried by the EM wave is delta V squared over Z so we can we can have less losses in the in the cable by making this capacitance smaller so that there's not as much current going into it so that means basically separate out your power lines and have them at high voltage all things considered end users typically want low voltage though you can't deal with 200,000 volts coming into your house uh, that's that's way too much for most <laughs> appliances so uh, what you need to do is find some way to step up and step down the voltage this is one of the reasons that AC voltage well if not the reason that AC voltage is is uh, is used for transmitting power even though almost everything in your house is uh, requires DC AC makes it a lot easier to use or makes it possible really to use inductors to uh, to step up and step down the voltage with relatively low losses you've probably seen this way back in high school this you've got this symbol for an inductor and with more windings on the left and less windings on the right then we've got a step down in the in the voltage and consequently a step up in the current so the formula for step down is this the voltage is basically related to the number of current uh, number of coils on the that side of the inductor and they're drawn like this but really the coils are around the the same kind of iron core material the point is to force all the flux created by one coil to also go through the other coil so that it couples the uh, the power from one to the other one what you may not have heard about before is capacitive field coupling so you can also step the voltage around by using capacitors nested so here's a here's a pair of capacitors where the the plates are overlapping a bit and you've got some area where uh, where the the plates are overlapping imagine you take a perfect case where they're overlapping completely This is going to lead to the highest possible capacitive coupling. You can do some calculations of looking at the change in the voltage Across one plate and change in the voltage across the other plate just that now we've got this different electric field intermediary to the two which is based on the uh, on the charge difference on those plates and it also kind of steps it adds to the electric field that would have been there anyway. Now, coming up with the, the calculations and working through them, you can work out that we have a relative voltage change from the front capacitor to the next capacitor that goes like this equation right here. In the high frequency limit, this works like a voltage ratio of C1 over C12, where C12 is this combined capacitance of the, the effectively new capacitor that we've created in the middle there. But because C12 is always larger than either C1 or C2, since it's got a smaller plate separation, unlike inductors, we can only create step-down transformers using capacitors. Update to that and slight correction to the book. Uh, the book has a has a bit of a typo when it has the resistance 
listed here in terms of the current or the voltage in terms of the resistance current. So they say V2 is negative I, is I2R, but it's actually negative I2R. The reason for that is the direction of I2. For I2 to be in the direction to charge this capacitor, like for I2 to really be the rate of change of Q2, it has to be going in the, in the right loop in the counterclockwise direction. But in the counterclockwise direction, that means that the voltage drop across R2 is the bottom relative to the top, which is the reverse of the voltage uh, direction we're measuring on C2. So the uh, that means there's a, a negative in front of the R everywhere that it appears in this equation. Another big topic that in this course we just want you to really be aware of is parasitic capacitance. So parasitic capacitance happens when the electric field from one circuit spills into another. So here's a, here's a piece of wire going through a resistor and then another wire, but the voltage created by this has an electric field that kind of extends out into space a bit. And uh, and this is influencing this metal sphere over here. And that creates uh, an, a charge displacement and a resistor. So this behaves like it's kind of a capacitor in a, with a resistor where this capacitor is coupled to the capacitor of the, of the two wires here and has some kind of a feedback that's going to affect our our circuit here in weird ways. This is usually unwanted and unintended. Generator and three phase power and antenna and radiation loss. Just very briefly, three phase power is a, is a type of electrical power that's common in, uh, in the real world. And it, uh, it basically has three different prongs, like the three prongs that you'd see in an outlet. And uh, what's going on is that every, every prong is 120 degrees out of phase with both of the other ones, but in different directions. So depending on if you take a split of the prong number one versus prong two or prong one versus prong three, you can get different, uh, different voltage, uh, voltage phase relationships. Antennas and radiation loss, any piece of wire that has an electric field oscillating up and down it is going to radiate away energy and, uh, and that makes an antenna in some circumstances, you're gonna to wanna to be aware of what's happening there. If you've got, uh, if you've got a, a coaxial a non-coaxial cable, one that isn't balanced properly, where it's not just shielded, you just got a bare wire, and then you've got really high frequencies going up and down this, or high amplitudes even, this is gonna be radiating away energy at the frequency of your electrical signal. So be careful not to microwave yourself. 3.9 noise reduction methods. There's many sources of random noise that can be picked up by a detector on a transmission line, such as the parasitic, inductive, or capacitive coupling noises. These, uh, these may be because there's other signals in those devices or just because of thermal fluctuations. So a signal to noise ratio of the ratio of the power is the ratio of the power of the coherent signal, the one that you're actually trying to measure and has a is like a real signal that you're looking at at the frequency you're looking at it at to the power of the noise on the same transmission line. An unbalanced line is a cable in which there's just a signal detected relative to uh, the conductor connected to ground. So we've got this cable going along and it's it's not balanced. It's not a, it's not a coaxial cable or anything. We're just detecting this device relative to some common ground, some return path that is through the ground. This can lead to unwanted noise in the measured signal if the ground isn't perfectly constant. For instance, let's look at this circuit here that we've got set up. So on the left-hand side, we've got a voltage and then we're gonna measure the voltage drop there. And uh, and on the same uh, maybe optical table or, or a thing that we've got, a, that we're using as our ground, we've got a circuit somewhere else where we're just running this heater because we're kind of cold while we're doing this voltage measurement. So we're gonna try and heat ourselves up over here with this resistor. Now, the problem is that the, uh, although we maybe think we have this, in reality, we might have something more like this where the there's a, a potential from this spot over to there, there's a resistance that goes like that and then resistance back. Maybe this is, this part of the ground is actually connected quicker to there than it is connected to this thing. So uh, the effective circuit may be more like this. Why is this a problem? Well, because our heater is running all this current through this resistor 
it might be running a current through this ground resistor and ground resistor on the way back here. So because we've got current going through this resistor, we'll measure a different potential difference across this thing than we were expecting, or than it actually is because of the, because of the potential drop across this resistor. So uh, a better way of wiring this up would be to specifically include Uh, that a better way of wiring this up would be to make sure that there's only one connection to ground going on. So there's exactly one ground in the circuit and, uh, and this heater element that we've got over here on the same, on the same table is connected to, uh, is just an isolated loop. And then from there, there's one line going out to ground. That's this way, even though we're measuring from ground, we're forcing the, uh, the current from this voltage to go through the heater itself, rather than kind of just connecting the tops together and connecting both of the bottoms of the element and the supply to ground. This is a way to avoid what's a so-called ground loop like this. Another way is if we want to transmit a signal from one spot to another one, and it's an AC signal, we can transmit both of the signals in phase and out of phase. Then along the way, maybe we pick up some signals because somebody's doing a radio broadcast next door and uh, or dynamos are switching around the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, and so our signal could pick up some noise. But the nice thing is that it would, it would have picked up the same noise pretty much because it's two cables that are close together. So by the time we get to the other side, we can just take the difference between these two and that should cancel out all of the extra noise that we picked up and give, give ourselves a nice clean uh, signal propagated from one section to the next. We're also going to skip spectral analysis and electrical noise and understanding the equipment spectral analyzer. But if you're going to be dealing with these, then by all means, come back and have a look at those. Exercise 319 showed that the impedance felt by the AC input in 314B, this one, is this, where I've made the resistance correction we pointed out earlier, which in the limit of negligible R becomes this. This part doesn't need the resistance correction. Give that a shot. Okay, so the voltage seen by the first side is Q1 over C1 plus Q2 over C12, where C12 is the mutual capacitance there. Taking a derivative, we can write that in terms of currents and saying that the voltage is I omega times, uh, times the voltage. The derivative of voltage is I omega times itself if it goes like some kind of a phasor. Then same thing for the other side and writing this voltage on the other side in terms of the resistance, we can figure out by substituting into here an equation that is just I2 in terms of I1, sub that back into this first equation, and then we've got an expression for V1 uh, and I1 and no other variables, just constants. Defining the effective impedance as their ratio, we come up with this expression, which is the same as they wanted us to come up with. Now in the limit of negligible R, does it turn into this? Well, let's, let's compare those. So we've got this one here and negligible R. Yep, looks good. Okay, we got it. Exercise 326. If V2 is 120 volts AC in the RMS and its load impedance to ground is 50 ohms and ZG and ZG prime are both one ohm, what is the fluctuation of the ground voltage that, uh, that we would see when we're measuring this voltage here? So when we're measuring V1 here, the voltage from there to there, how much would this voltage be what would be the fluctuation in the in the measurement here? In other words, how much would we be seeing this change by because of this? Okay, this basically just means calculate the voltage across this thing. By writing this as a voltage divider, it's this resistance over the sum of these three multiplied by this voltage. Going through that, we've got 2.3 volts in the RMS sense. So we would see a 2.3 volt RMS kind of ripple 
in, in this voltage, or it would just be off by a flat 2.3 volts if these two voltage signals happen to be the same frequency and perfectly in phase. Otherwise, it would be noisy, um, some, some higher frequency component adjustment to our voltage signal.